Hello and welcome to Scope. I'm Wakar Rizvi. Thank you for joining us for another session. In today's segment, the first segment, that is, we're going to discuss how the United Nations Security Council has renewed its calls for an arms embargo to be placed on Libya. Now, this obviously all comes as the situation in Libya continues to get worse. This, of course, has been something that's been systematic ever since the downfall of Muammar Gaddafi, as well as his assassination, as you'll remember. Um, why is the United Nations now acting surprised about this? And why is it now trying to rein in the situation of this arms flow into Libya? Or has it, in fact, been trying so far but not succeeding? Is the situation beyond even the UN's controls? And then what does that even say about the UN body and what it's worth in situations such as Libya? Let's discuss all of that a bit further. We're joined now by Mirko Giordani, who is a political analyst. He's joining us now from London. We're also joined by Husni Mulhi, who is a political analyst and author. He's joining us now from Tunis in Tunisia. Husni and Mirko, thank you both for joining us. Uh, Mirko, I'd like to start with you. Um, it struck me as odd, Mirko, that the UN uh, Security Council would, would put out this statement in the way that it did, because it's interesting, isn't it, that a Security Council member itself, such as France, is involved quite heavily in Libya. Why not call out France? The problem is that this UN Security Council resolution demonstrates how um, useless is the is UN. You know, uh, disasters in Libya are happening uh, since uh, 2011, and uh, now the situation with Al Sarraj and Haftar is a is a long it's a long situation and it's carrying on for months and months and only now UN is uh, is calling for a complete ban of uh, of weapons to both factions in Libya. However, uh, in geopolitics, uh, it's clear that uh, who has power is uh, highly recognizable. And yeah. in this uh, in this situation in Libya, who has the power is not the UN. Who has the power are two heads, the one that support Al-Siraj mm. and uh, Aftar. So UN in this geopolitical game doesn't have power, and it's very clear. But Mirko, aren't you, you, aren't you, aren't you forgetting the, the European and Western uh, role in all of this? Uh, that's an important role, isn't it? It's less important. Let me tell you this. I spoke with a former foreign minister of Italy, and I spoke with various analysts about it, and they all agree that in Libya, the most powerful brokers are not based in Europe. It's not France, it's not Italy with its former colonial history in Libya. The most important brokers, and obviously we are, we are not forgetting America. America, it's America, but now America, it's disengaging from the Libya state. I want to I wanna put that point to Hosni. I would call out Mirko on that as I did. I feel like the, the Western role in all of this is, is important, isn't it? I mean, there's a reason why France, why Siraj and Haftar both have contacts with France. Certainly France is an important player, isn't it? Um, yes, they, they, they are of course important, important uh, but they are um, they are divided, and even within their own uh, administrations, it is fragmented. You can see, for example, how Trump uh, two months ago calls uh, calls Hafter directly, and now. Uh, he pulls back, and uh, it's 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 not clear. While uh, there are also changes uh, within uh, European, uh, I mean, with the exception of the UK that has had so far uh, a clear position on this, on this France yeah. has been uh, rather ambivalent. However, it's uh, why, uh, as Nicole just mentioned, the, the, the Gulf states are considered the most important actors is because their line is very clear. It's very, uh, the, the stakes for them are very uh, well determined, mm. and they know what they want out of the conflict. Mm. Uh, and that uh, makes the decision of the UN uh, a, 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 a welcome decision, although it's mm. clearly uh, too late for that now. The, the spread of weapons has, uh, you know, has reached uh, a high toll in Libya, and both uh, sides are well, uh, are well armed for the conflict. Um, and then and on, on that yes. point you just made there then, Hosni, why 
has the national community? Why has the UN as the body that is meant to be controlling all such situations? Why has it let it get to this point, do you think? Well, the UN, the UN is, UN is nothing without the member states. If the, if the member states and the most powerful states are not willing to enforce uh, the decisions of the UN, they, they, are, they remain meaningless. So the UN doesn't have its own, uh, uh, its own, its own, uh, its own uh, uh, armed forces that they can mm. send uh, wherever they want. I mean, they always depend on that for for. Uh, they depend on on on, on member states mm. uh, to to provide those uh, uh, those, those forces. Yeah. And they tried. Uh, they tried. To, to broker an agreement between Haftar and uh, and uh, and uh, Siraj and the government of national accords, uh, and that completely um, uh, went uh, went uh, went awry, uh, and that's because if you if you'll need to read that more broadly uh, the, uh, in, in, on, on, and uh, and see what's happening in the region more more broadly, uh, okay. the the two boring sides. Are 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 in are, um, are not ready to uh, to accept the other. Uh, Qatar, for example, and the Emirates are. Uh, uh, Qatar. Let's just uh, recall that it's a country that is living uh, under a blockade uh, for for over. See, I, don't, I don't remember exactly, but uh, over a year or two now. Mm. Uh, they they can't. It takes a long time to fly into Qatar because you have to fly around all the countries. Uh, uh, Gulf states, including uh, yeah. Egypt. Yeah. Uh, so these countries are at war. They are not ready mm. to tolerate that the other uh, faction survives this conflict. Okay, so then the if, if I may come in, Hosni, Amirko, somebody is, is getting a benefit off of the situation. Uh, you know, and I probably, you know, can can list a number of companies that are probably operating and are operating in Libya when it comes to, for example, its oil sector. And obviously, Libya is an important player when it comes to the oil markets worldwide. Do you think that a lot of this miracle, this silence on the part of the international community is because of Libya's natural resources, that somebody is siphoning that off quietly while the rest of the country is just fighting with each other? In this case, when we speak about oil and energy and trade, I can speak for my country, I can speak for Italy. Italian foreign policy, for example, in Libya is not guided by policy making, it's guided by the national oil company. It's called NENI. -N -I, yeah. And uh, the oil fields are based all in Tripoli, so under the control of Al Siraj. And this is an example of why, for example, Italy is supporting. Uh, the tenuous government of Al Siraj, because oh. because in Al Siraj territory there are the oil fields, mm. and for example France with Total, they have the oil field in the Cyrenaica, which mm. is the part controlled by Haftar. So especially for Western countries, yes, I can say that their foreign policy in Libya and their moves are guided more and more, not only, but more and more, by their energy interest in the area. And let me say something about Libya. Um, the, the, the deputy of um, the interim president after Gaddafi said that uh, having a Libya divided, it's the worst outcome ever. Because, because maybe Haftar now is pushing through Tripoli, just to freeze the conflict and have a Libya divided. Mm. And uh, this interim president said one time that Libya was uh, united only under the king and under the dictator. Mm. And having a Libya divided, it's a very bad thing, both for the Western powers, such as Italy and France, and okay. both for the Gulf state. But, but then it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not that yeah. bad, it's not that bad a thing, though, is it, Mirko? I mean, if you get from the Italian government's point of view or even the French government's point of view, if the Libyans are fighting amongst each other uh, and their companies, their respective oil companies, be it Total or any, are making off with the oil, um, why would Italy and France complain in such a situation? The problem is immigration. During the Gaddafi period, there was... a uh, an agreement between uh, Europe 
especially Italy and Libya, that in exchange for investment, Libya's borders were sealed. The border with the sea, they were sealed. Mm. Having a Libya divided with one part of Libya with a strong man like uh, Haftar, and the other part, a weak state supported by Al Sarraj and uh, ONU, will allow, you know, like more a country is divided, more is chaotic, and more traffickers can thrive. And that's so a very good point, Mirko. If, if that's a very good point, Mirko, because that's the point to bring up, in fact, Hosni, with you as well. I wanted to get your thoughts firstly, of course, Hosni, on the natural resources argument about oil, as Mirko there pointed out, to any on one side, Total on the other. And then secondly, are those countries, is Europe, and should it be, in fact, worried about the Libya situation because of asylum seekers showing up on its shores? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the oil oil issue is is very important. But um, I think uh, having worked for some time at uh, recently at, at, at the um, with with uh, foreign office of a European state, the, the the migrants issue comes out more often in uh, in conversations and in official documents. Uh, it is it is a, a, a very it is a very problematic. Now they have the what they call the ring of instability around Europe that they need to stabilize, and Libya is one of the hot spots uh, of that, and it's a priority country in in, in the strategies of of, of different uh, European states. So, so Hosni, um, I, I apologize for interrupting because so we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask you, Hosni, just just for clarification's purpose, do you think then that the Europeans only wanted to resolve this Libya situation? at a time when migration and asylum seekers became an issue for them. Until that time, do you think that they were fine with, with the situation in Libya as is, uh, as long as, of course, they were getting oil and or whatever other benefits they wanted? I think it's, they are fine with the situation as it was, uh, including for the, uh, for the migrants, because it is easier to control the borders in the, in the situation as it is now than if, because that many, many, um, many measures uh, can be um, enforced that are not necessarily legal uh, in this, in this, as long as Libya is a no man's land yeah. uh, and, uh, and there is no, or at least there is a failed state. Now, if order was to, to be restored in Libya, there are measures like using uh, militias to control the, the, the sea, mm. the seashore and to to uh, to reduce the number of migrants will be less and less uh, feasible. Okay. So uh, they have a lot to use, but they also need to take into consideration that this is Libya's third civil war, and that with every civil war, with every war, the situation becomes even more problematic and peace becomes impossible. Already, I work in, 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 uh, in, in, in on a uh, um, uh, reconcili reconciliation initiative. Yeah. Now, what's special to say is that it is no longer possible to have a unified Libya as before mm, because mm. the soci society itself is divided uh, against itself. Against Very well. Itself. All right, we'll leave that as a final point. Jen, of course, we appreciate both of your time, your insight and analysis. That was Mirko and Hosni. Mirko speaking to us from London, Hosni speaking to us from the Tunisian capital. Now, as our guests are mentioned, viewers, uh, the situation, it's interesting because there are a lot of conflicting interests here, but at least in my point of view, the European interests and Western interests seem quite clear, actually. They were fine with the situation, as is in Libya, even the chaos, as long as they were siphoning off oil and natural resources of the country. It only became a problem when migrants started showing up on their shores, and we now have more right-wing governments in place in places like Italy and others who obviously then receive a lot of those migrants that cross over from Libya via, of course, the Mediterranean or otherwise. Uh, we'll keep a close eye on how that situation develops there in Libya, but this call for the UN arms embargo may be, as one of our guests are mentioned, too little, too late. Uh, the UN body once again proving itself quite weak in the situation. We'll be back after a short break with our next segment. Stay tuned. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here in Scope with me, Wakar Rizvi. In this segment, we're going to discuss uh, an international crisis group report that has come out on its site uh, discussing the situation in the city of Jerusalem, uh, talking about how that city could become a minority Jewish city by the year 2045, according to estimates, of course, and depending on the demographic changes that are taking place in that city. Of course, Israel and its government uh, would like 
there to be a Jewish majority in that city um, into the long term, of course. Um, but that does not seem to be the trend at this time, as many of the Israeli Jews seem to be moving out and or are not being attracted, uh, whatever the Israeli government does. This is at a time the Palestinian demographics seem to be in favor of the Palestinians. They seem to be growing in number, and they are remaining put in Jerusalem, East Jerusalem specifically, of course. Uh, what does this mean then, and why is there this obsession, really, about having this Jewish majority in that city? This is at a time, of course, the context is important that the U.S. has moved its embassy to Jerusalem at a time that the deal of the century, quote-unquote, is being discussed, and at a time that now Israel wants there to be a law in place um, that will at, according to it, will reduce inequality. But is this really about that? Is this about more demographics uh, at its roots? Let's discuss all of that a bit further. We're joined by uh, Nikos Paniotis. He is a, the head of the Str Geostrategic Observatory of the Middle East and assistant professor of international politics at the American College. He is joining us now from Nicosia in Cyprus via Skype. We're also joined by Nina Orto, who is a freelance journalist. He specializes in Israel. He's also the founder and editor-in-chief of a specialistic platform which provides insight and analysis on the Middle East. He's joining us now from Oxford in the UK on the line. Nino and Nico and Nikos, uh, thank you both for joining us. Nick, I'll start with you. Uh, what do you make of this, this concern about demographics when it comes to Jerusalem and, in fact, the greater occupied territories? This has been you know, a topic of conversation for a while now, hasn't it? Tiaru Akar, I would like to underline that from 1967, when the Six-Day War erupted, and uh, these areas were uh, held under Israeli occupation, yeah. the Israeli government is uh, promoting a ne neocolonial relationship with this, uh, in these areas in order to alter the demographic structure of the region. Hmm. East Jerusalem is at the epicenter of the conflict because both parts in the conflict wanted as their capital. So it is very important. According to my humble opinion, the Jewish state wants to entrench more its annexation, its de facto annexation of uh, East Jerusalem. And mm. so it is very uh, alarmed by the change of uh, these demographic structures in the region you have already mentioned. Yeah. What, what do you make of that, Nino? Why is there this obsession? And it doesn't seem to be uh, something that uh, a state which calls itself democratic should be as worried about? Well, I think uh, 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 that this is a false problem because in the long run, it is true that there is a decline of the Jewish persons in Jerusalem compared to the, Arab, to the Palestinians. But at the same time, there is a huge number and, which is raising of the Orthodox. So I think that it's in 10 to 15 years, if the lights will move uh, out to Jerusalem, there will be a huge uh, number of Orthodox instead. Hmm. And what, will, what will that change then mean? Because I, I'm glad you brought that point up, Nino, because just before here, in fact, I was reading an article about that. Uh, what does that mean then for Israel if there were to be more Orthodox Jews versus uh, the other segments of Jewish society? What does that mean then for Israeli politics, Israeli governance? Well, for sure, they will, they will lose uh, a grasp uh, on this population because, as you know, uh, Orthodox, they don't, uh, accept the army, they do not never join the army. Mm. So, for um, from the side of uh, the Israeli government, will be more difficult for them to control that. Mm. So they will uh, they will rely more on the. Um, settlement outside Jerusalem. In this situation, Nick, at this time, why do you think it is that Israel hasn't been able to attract or maintain the Jewish population in Jerusalem as it so wishes? You know, the embassy, the U.S. embassy has moved there. I believe a number of other countries have also announced that their embassies will move there. The status of Jerusalem seems to be at least on paper in Israel's favor. Uh, why then will it not be, or has it not been successful in convincing Israeli Jews to remain in Jerusalem? 
I think I think these uh, areas are, uh, are, uh, are are impoverished. If I use the the, the, the main word, it is uh, one of the reasons I can think is this uh, because of the status of the of the economic status of the region. So uh, this is the reason I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, and then what does this mean then, do you think, for, for Palestinians overall then, Nick? Because many people would say that if you're continuing to put the Palestinians into a corner, they will react in some way, won't they? Uh, I think uh, if we see what it is mentioned in the, in the report of the group, of the international group, of this group, uh, the policies of... Uh, the, the Jewish policies mm -hmm. are exacerbating the conflict, and uh, they may spark a, a, a further conflict in the region if they continue to neglect the Palestinian needs and trying to promote uh, a political agenda that is against Palestinian uh, needs in the region. Mm. Uh, as far as I know, they, one of the schemes is to, um, to create regional uh, councils and excise, exclude yeah. some Palestinian regions from East Jerusalem in order, sorry, in order to increase the number of the Jewish population there. Yeah. Uh, this is, I think, it's contrary to international law. But as I have mentioned before, Jerusalem is at the epicenter of the conflict. Hmm. So... Israel will do everything in order to promote its agenda, favored by the latest developments that you have said. Yeah. I mean the translocation of the American embassy to Jerusalem uh, from Tel Aviv, the recognition of the occupied Golan Heights, Indeed. the defunding of the agency for the Palestinian refugees, and etc. Hmm. I think uh, at the end of the day, Israel wants to, to go on with, it, with its plans. There are many voices in Israeli government and in Israeli political arena that are in favor of the annexation of West Bank. So then, uh, Nick, if, if, I, if I may come in for a moment, because all, everything we're describing, it's because Israel describes itself as a Jewish state uh, or a state for the Jewish people, however it terms it. Uh, do you think that that is at risk right now? Uh, many people are saying that, listen, Israel should just accept that it will not be a Jewish state. It should just accept that it will be a state for both Jews and Palestinian Arabs, be they Muslims, Christians, or otherwise. Uh, what I know, Wagar, is that one, the main demand, one of the main demands of the Jewish uh, political, uh, of, of the Jewish politicians, of the Jewish government, I think both uh, Likud and the Labour wants the Palestinians in a future agreement to recognize the Jewish character of the Jewish state. That mm. means to accept that the Palestinian refugees will not uh, return to their homes yeah. and that it will uh, recognize the Jewish character of the state, that it is unacceptable for the Palestinian side. Now, if some uh, human rights are neglected in the domestic sphere of uh, mm. Israel, it's another issue. If we're looking at this deal of the century right now, Nick, uh, do you think that uh, the Donald Trump administration or others are actually going to present a plan which will be satisfactory regarding Jerusalem uh, to both sides? I think uh, neither uh, American politicians uh, neither nor uh, Palestinians believe to this plan. Even Port Pompeo, the American foreign minister, admitted that it is a very difficult job to be done. If we focus on Palestinians' leader statements, the plan is, is born dead. Mm. I think it is an effort to help the Jewish state on several uh, levels, but it is counterproductive because it, it, is, it will not address the main issues of uh, the, the main issues and needs of the Palestinian population. Uh, 
Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, the Palestinian refugees, yeah. uh, the status of uh, all these uh, monuments in East Jerusalem, all of these sites of uh, religious of uh, religious significance. There are many issues that gap the both sides. Mm. Uh, the biased uh, attitude of the American government, uh, I think, has convinced the Palestinians that cannot collaborate with them, and they say that they will not accept. I think it will be biased. So then this, is, this is, it sounds like a trap, doesn't it, Nick, for the Palestinians? Either it sounds like a lose-lose situation, doesn't it? Where if they reject the deal of the century, they'll be blamed for, for a lack of peace. And if they accept it, then they'll be blamed for, for, for selling out, really, to, to uh, you know, the biased U.S. Trump administration, as you said. So what should the Palestinians be doing? Again, as I mentioned earlier, it seems that they're in a corner. So if they react with violence everyone will point the fingers at them. Uh, viol violence is not the, the answer, but if you, if you ask objectively and if you talk with a, pal a Palestinian or a Palestinian politician, it will tell you how can I uh, negotiate on fair basis since America, that should be an honest broker, uh, prejudges the status of some very important elements mm. of the whole conflict. Yeah. So we have to wait and see what it will happen because I don't know, I'm not quite sure if they will announce on time this plan because they said at the end of June mm. uh, in Bahrain they will announce the economic uh, part of the plan and afterwards uh, okay. the political plan. But we have elections in Israel we, we, we will have elections. There is a period, uh, an electoral or pre-electoral period in America. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, things are very complicated. So one tell and, that. And, yeah, and, and Nick, I'm, I'm going to so pick up. Sorry, I'm going to. Yeah, if, if I may, Nick, just because uh, you mentioned the economy, I think that's an important point, Nick, if you allow me, because Nino's back on. So I want to ensure I get his point of view on this. Nick, Nino, um, when it comes to this this issue of the economy, because when it comes to this five-year plan that Israel is adopting, its aim is to reduce social economic inequality, specifically in East Jerusalem. The Jared Kushner plan also calls for essentially money to be thrown at the Palestinians for their economy to improve. Um, do you think the Palestinians are buying any of this? Well, I don't think Palestinians will buy any of this because without any rights, any civil rights, and any freedom of movement in the West Bank, there won't be any 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 state, so uh, it's very hard for Palestinians to uh, accept the Trump deal of the century. But then I guess it can be argued, Nino, that for example, there it's and it has been argued is that there are some Palestinians in the West Bank, in Ramallah, in other places that are doing quite well financially. In fact, living within uh, the occupied territories. And then, of course, there is the impoverished Gaza, which is a separate case in that sense. Uh, do you think that there is almost a division within Palestinians as well, possibly, about that issue? Well, of course, there are, there are, they, are, they are torn apart, actually, because many Palestinians now are thinking that the main solution and the best solution for the conflict is the one-state solution, where Israel will get over uh, the economic and also in the West Bank, they can already see the benefit. But on the other side, there are many which are struggling with this decision and with this opinion uh, within the, the Palestinians. And this is, uh, this is an issue that the Trump uh, and the deal of the century has to face. Mm. And do you think, Nino, that, that the concern about um, Israel needing to preserve its Jewish identity, identity and security concerns then, uh, are those valid in this case? I think the main problem now in Israel is that the Palestinians can't see any uh, future. So the Israeli and the Americans have to deal with that. Mm. That's the main point. It's not a problem of demographics, and it's not a problem of international law or uh, occupation. The main problem is Palestinians can't see any future for them, 
And who has to address this problem? Is it PA or Israel? Okay, and then Nino, then in, in such a desperate situation, how, should, how are we going to expect Palestinians to react, the Palestinian street that is? Uh, you know, will they be reacting with violence? And, and then what happens next? Well, the violence, violence is always uh, uh, an option that is on the table in this part of the world. But nobody can answer yet. Everybody has to wait till the deal of the century will be unveiled. And then we will see what, what will happen. Because at the moment, nobody can mm. see what will happen in one month or two months. Okay, so I'll give the final word to you, Nick. Um, I apologize for interrupting before, but if we're looking at, once again, just the situation when it comes to Jerusalem itself, uh, it, what do you make of what the status of that city will be going forward, realistically speaking? Or do you think it will remain something that will be unresolved for the foreseeable future? I think, uh, as far as I know, the status of Jerusalem is Jerusalem. It's the most intractable in terms of conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, during uh, previous negotiations, there were many uh, schemes about East Jerusalem to divide the religious, uh, the, the place, uh, the places of religious significance of the Jewish and give them to the Jews and that of the Muslims to the Muslims. But I don't think it's it, if, if, if this means to square the circle, if this is impossible, because mm. uh, as, uh, I don't want to indulge uh, more in this. We have to, uh, okay. we can make another, uh, we can talk about hours of, uh, about this, but yeah. uh, from the past experience, it's very difficult for the two sides to agree especially mm. for East Jerusalem. Mm. So we have this violence in defenders arising from there. Uh, mm. I want to ask you something with regard to a clarification, if I may. Sure. When you were asking about uh, demographic alteration, you were talking mainly about Jerusalem or about the Israeli state or just about East Jerusalem, because well, it's, it's, it's difficult. Of course, it's different. And no, I was talking about both, in fact. And you, you can just make a division between those two. But mainly in this show, we've been discussing about Jerusalem as a whole, both West and East, because, uh, you know, for, for both sides, they, they view Jerusalem as one entity and not just divided into West and East. And I know, of course, that there are concerns, even when it comes to the entire uh, Israel as we as we see it now slash occupied territories in the words of the Palestinians uh, unfortunately we'll have to leave it there though for now and I will uh, have you both back on to continue this conversation because I know that this is a situation which uh, requires a lot more discussion and there are a lot more facets to this discussion I'll thank uh, Nick there and Nino Nick speaking to us from Nicosia and Nino was speaking to us from Oxford as they mentioned um, this issue over Jerusalem and the concerns over demographics might be overblown and might be being used by by certain uh, Israeli politicians to further their more right wing ambitions and to, in fact, put in place bills and laws uh, talking about inequality in East Jerusalem. But what's really at the root of that? What are really their intentions? Is it about, in fact, excising uh, the Palestinian neighborhoods? in favor of them having a majority, ensuring, in fact, a majority Jewish population in Jerusalem. And the, uh, the, the comedic twist to all of this is that this is all coming at the same time that the U.S. has moved its embassy to Jerusalem. So at a time that the status of Jerusalem, at least on paper, seems to be in Israel's favor, the population is not following that trend at this time. We'll keep a close eye on those demographic changes and other of course, uh, developments regarding Israel slash Palestine here in Scope. I'll be back, though, uh, with our next segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. Thanks for staying with us here in Scope with me, Wakar Rizvi. In this segment, we're going to discuss North Korea and the fact that the Wall Street Journal has spoken about the fact that Kim Jong-nam, you'll remember, who is the half-brother of Kim Jong-un, who was assassinated back in 2017, I believe it was, uh, at an airport in Malaysia. Uh, he was a CIA informant, according to the Wall Street Journal. Um, and, of course, then this raises many questions, not only about the relationship between the United States and North Korea in the past, because you'll remember that Donald Trump has said that he 
uh, will not or would not have wanted uh, Kim Jong-nam to be an informant for the United States and that he feels that his relationship with Kim Jong-un is in fact a positive one. Uh, but in, in this entire episode sheds light on how the CIA and, and other intelligence agencies operate really around the world when it comes to such uh, countries such as North Korea, which would be ar arguably is quite a closed society and is quite hard to penetrate into. Um, is this normal? Uh, did did the CIA inform Kim Jong-nam that his life would be in danger for working with it? Uh, we'll discuss all of that now with our panelists. We're joined now by Vasco da Cruz Amador, who is founder and CEO of the Global Intelligence Insight, which is a London-based cyber intelligence project. He's also a former intelligence officer himself and a covert unit commander. He's joining us now from Lisbon. We're also joined by Patrick F. Walsh, who is an associate professor of intelligence and security studies at the Australian Graduate School of Policing and Security at Charles Stewart University. Patrick and Vasco, thank you both for joining us. Um, Patrick, I'd like to start with you. Uh, what do you make of, of the use of the half-brother of, of a leader such as Kim Jong-un? Uh, obviously, for a country such as North Korea, which takes such things quite seriously, uh, what, do you think this was a smart move on the part of the Americans? Uh, thanks, Wakir. Well, look, I think um, as, as I'm probably not cross, cross, cross all the details, and whether in fact that he actually was um, working for the CIA. So I think that needs a bit more work, um, and I need to be a bit more informed. But I'd say as a general principle, it's a bit risky, um, but knowing the Kim, Kim Jong un regime um, and the actual value that. Uh, if this was true, that the CIA would get out of someone like him, given that um, the, the estrangement you know he has with his half brother, the ruler, um, and given that largely he spent most of his time is, from what I understand, in exile. So the question I have is, even if he was an asset, um, actually how much uh, information and intelligence was he able to glean on behalf of the Central Intelligence Agency? Is another thing altogether. Um, I, I know over the years, obviously. Uh, U.S. intelligence has not been able to have very good access, mm. both SIGINT and HUMINT, into North Korea. Um, and that has meant that it has been difficult to sort of, at times, assess um, intentions and, and, and to understand, uh, you know, where Kim Jong-un's going with uh, nuclear proliferation um, and how we can, you know, deal with the regime. So, mm. so it, it's a kind of a risky... Um, if it's true, it's kind of a risky uh, placement of, of someone doing work for the U.S. in that context. Hmm. Vasco, what do you make of it? Because, you know, it, it's been argued, I've read a number of pieces that would say that, listen, because, as, as uh, Patrick there mentioned, because North Korea is such a closed society that anybody who can shed even a little bit of light on how North Korea and its political system works would be of great value to, to any intelligence agency. Do you think that that's a fair point in this case, Vasco? Well, um, um, thanks, thanks for having me, um, Wakar. And um, well, my, my insight with this is um, this will go straight to the use of sources and informants, um, not only by the CIA, but only but in, in, in regards to all intelligence agencies. Um, what we need to, to be focused here is, <clears throat> as he was in exile for almost the last uh, 15 years, just before his assassination, um, will be the information that probably, if he was, because uh, nobody is still confirmed about um, if he was an informant or not, if he was being used as a source, <clears throat> as actually all the intelligence agencies are uh, still using, and human intelligence is one, one of the core uh, that we need to um, um, take part in. Yeah. Uh, but was his information accurate enough to, to, to provide uh, uh, the, US, the, the, the U.S. intelligence with this kind of information. So probably the information that he has, um, or he had, um, was uh, from the past. And we don't know well in which way um, they, they, they were still working. So uh, we need to be very cautious when we are dealing with sources or informants. First of all, because we need to take care and we need to check if they are working for both sides, or if it's uh, it's a real um, information, or if it's a, a real uh, um, actionable intelligence that we are collecting. And then, of course, that we need to double check because uh, 
<laughs> it's um, uh, sometimes it's a nightmare when we are dealing with this. And and for this particular case, my point is, uh, was this um, an accurate insight for mm. uh, um, the U.S. intelligence, or only uh, kind of a conversation that probably will take place, and then they were they they were trying to get in place um, some real intelligence from North Korea. Uh, I think yeah. that we, we we need to focus with uh, with this kind of uh, idea because uh, it's it's the most important to start with. And you know, uh, um, Patrick, when one hears about such as, and especially uh, we've as we've been showing some of the CCTV images of when that assassination took place at that airport in Malaysia, Patrick, this all reads and looks very much like one of those thriller novels, doesn't it? Um, for those of us, at least, who have not worked in intelligence. But I I'm wondering, on the point that Vasco there made about the value that uh, sources bring and whether that information can be verified or not, how does one balance all of that out, really? Because then we can see that it can have a detrimental impacts when it comes to, for example, the Iraq war and the WMDs, the entire case fell apart, really, didn't it, after the U.S. invasion? Uh, what do you make of how that can be or if it can even be balanced? So, so to your question of the value, value of that, I think what here is a very, really, really important one. And, and I think human intelligence is, you know, when it's good, it's good. And when you have a good, uh, you know, an agent, uh, you have, or you have a good um, non-declared officer from your own country in the country that's sort of infiltrating, uh, you know, a terrorist group or, you know, a government or foreign government or whatever, it can be really good information. But if you're dealing with someone that you're, you know, who has a motivation, whatever their motivation is, if it's money or it's because they've got an issue with a regime, regime where they're at or whatever it is, you're dealing with, you know, you're dealing with someone that um, might have multiple motivations, and they're not necessarily completely loyal uh, to you or to, you know, to the agency that you represent or to the country you represent. And so it takes quite a while to establish whether someone is, you know, you can have a relationship with someone, you can trust them. You may not want them to be your best friend, but you certainly want to be able to trust them. Um, and that, that there is some question of some at least degree of loyalty is developed between you and the agent. Um, that they start delivering so on a fairly consistent basis, um, you know, reliable information that can be uh, validated from other intelligence sources. Hopefully, that's the ideal state. But often, human on its own is not enough. You know, when you're mm. dealing with complex issues, and particularly like North Korea, um, you can have exiles from countries of repressive regimes who will who will say anything to kind of get protection mm. or payment for their family or for themselves, or even exile eventually mm. uh, to a safe country. So the motivations of these people can often be mixed um, and that plays into the kind of quality and reliability and delivery of the intelligence yeah. you're collecting and mm -hmm. paying for. So, you know, human uh, can be very, very valuable. In some cases, it can be mm. the best kind of intelligence, but it all depends on the context, the, the sort of agent, you know, you're running with yeah. um, and, and that takes a long time to work out whether you can, you know, if worthy the investment sometimes, it's worth okay. it. Well, thank both of our guests. Vasco there was speaking to us from Lisbon, and we were also joined by Patrick, uh, who was on holiday. So we appreciate Patrick uh, somewhere in Europe, I believe it is, in the UK, I think. Um, so Patrick, we of course appreciate you taking your time out of your holiday to speak to us as well. Uh, as both of our guests there mentioned, this is of course, a murky world, but human intelligence is vital to how not only just Western intelligence works, but any intelligence agency works, but then one needs to then figure out a way to verify the information that they would bring. Specifically on the case of Kim Jong-nam, what was the value of any intelligence that he would have brought to the CIA? Why would it reach out to him when they knew that he was in exile for many, many years and uh, in fact preferred many times to remain away from North Korean politics? Recently though, and that is before he was assassinated, he had speak started speaking out at least against his younger half-brother. Uh, you remember that he was put in exile because he was basically dethroned as the heir to, the, to, the, to this dynasty, really, the Kim dynasty there in North Korea. What does all of this mean uh, behind the scenes about how intelligence works uh, and how informants are gotten rid of or even found? And if that information is reliable, what kind of impact that has on policymaking? We can talk about Iraq, otherwise, etc. We'll keep a close eye on all of that in North Korea as well and how that relationship with the U.S. works out going forward also. Uh, thank you, though, for joining us for this edition of Scope. Avion Rokar Rizvi, take care.